So, welcome back everybody. Sorry for the delay. Um, so today I thought that our, our talk should be about the Gaia mission. So I've given a talk about this once before, and when I was doing the, um, the research for this, <laughs> so when I was doing the research for this, um, I found it just to be an incredibly uh, impressive mission. Just the engineering that goes into uh, to making this mission work and some of the things that it is designed to do are, to me, is truly mind-boggling. So I thought we would talk a little bit about that. Um, the title, The Hubble of Astrometry, um, is just kind of an ode to the Hubble Space Telescope, which we all know gives us these incredibly impressive images. Dr. Bob O'Dell will be here uh, next week to discuss the Hubble Space Telescope with you. Um, but Gaia is going to be measuring the positions, velocities, and a few other parameters of stars and other types of objects with incredible precision. Okay? Um, so if you think back to last week's, um, to, uh, last week's talk, we spoke about different ways in which astronomers are able to determine distances to different objects. And if you recall, the first one that we spoke about was a method known as parallax. And that was one of the very few ways which you can directly uh, determine the distance of an object. So if you recall, um, we've got our, in this little diagram, I'm sorry I didn't make this larger, um, we've got our sun here, we've got our earth orbiting around our sun, we've got some very, very distant faraway objects, maybe extremely distant background stars, and then we have a nearby star. And the parallax effect is basically you see this nearby star shifting position as we change our viewing position. So the amount of shift that we're going to see of this nearby star against the background is going to be uh, due to the distance of that star. So the closer it is to us, the, uh, the more it's going to appear to shift back and forth. And um, it also has to do with our baseline, how much we're actually moving. So if we were to see this star shift just a tiny bit from our vantage point here on the Earth, if we were able to go out to, say, Jupiter, which is five times farther from the Sun than the Earth is, we would see that star shift five times as much. Okay? So the bigger the baseline, the bigger the change in your, your vantage point, the easier it is to measure this parallax. So let me give a, just a little bit of history about this gentleman here. So Tycho Brahe. He, a lot of people call him Tycho or Tycho Brahe, a lot of different ways to, pron uh, to pronounce his name. Um, he was a Danish astronomer. Um, he was born into Danish nobility, and you can imagine that probably has some benefits. Um, he acquired his own island, and on that island he would set up a, a very, very nice observatory, one of the best in his day. Um, you'll notice the years that he lived here, 1546 to 1601, um, he lived before the telescope was invented, so he died about 10 years before the first telescope would be pointed up towards the heavens. Um, but nevertheless, he had a lot of really, really nice instruments at his observatory, and they basically allowed him to make very precise measurements of positions of the objects in the sky uh, relative to the horizon, relative to one another. Um, he was able to get positions of stars, uh, the five known planets, which at the time he didn't know what a planet was, he just knew that there were these objects that moved among the stars. Uh, so he was really noted for making a very, um, uh, a very detailed catalog of different positions of objects. Um, you can see here in this depiction, which is actually, uh, I don't know, it's kind of busy unless you get right up next to it, but you see him here towards the, the center of the image and he's got uh, what's known as a large mural quadrant. And that's basically a, a very large instrument that was used to measure angles of objects on the sky or, or positions of objects in the sky. Um, being of nobility, he also had quite a few servants uh, to help him out with his observations. So in the end, he just had a catalog of uh, about 1,000 stars that he knew the, the positions of to about one arc minute resolution. Okay, so if you imagine going out looking at uh, the full moon or um, the crescent moon, try to find the smallest object you can see by eye, that's a resolution of about one arc minute. Okay? So um, that's as good as you can get because the, the best optical instrument that they had at that time was the human eye. Okay? So the, 
The telescope would increase our resolution by at least a factor of 10, even Galileo's first telescopes, which were very dinky compared to even today's amateur telescopes, um, increased the resolution by about a factor of 10. Uh, other fun thing about Tycho, he was involved in a sword duel when he was a young man, and he didn't fare too well in that. Uh, ended up losing the bridge of his nose, and so in a lot of depictions of him, you see him wearing a brass prosthetic. Okay? But as it turns out, he ended up making amends with the guy that, um, that uh, did the damage. So, interesting character. So, um, Tycho thought, all right, if, so the Copernican system, or the Copernican solar system, is the, the first real big push by Nicholas Copernicus to promote this idea of a sun being at the center of our solar system and the five known planets and the earth are all going around that sun. And so Tycho thought, okay, if this is correct, then we're moving around the sun, we ought to see these stars moving back and forth because of this parallax effect. But in the end, even though he had some of the best observational instruments of the time, he was not able to measure a parallax of any stars. So you can either, um, you can either come to two conclusions. One is that you know, your, your observations just aren't good enough, you're not able to see this parallax, or two, there is no parallax and the stars are not actually moving. So he, he jumped to the wrong conclusion. He surmised that the stars could not be so far away that we would not be able to see a shift in the parallax. And from that, he concluded that the Copernican model of the solar system, where we have the, the sun at the center and the earth going around and all the planets going around, was not correct. So he modified that system just a little bit to kind of fit what he had found. And so here we have up here, this is our sun. We have Mercury, Venus going around the sun, correct so far. Earth is at the right distance. It's in between Venus and Mars. You have Mars here, Jupiter here, and Saturn here all going around the sun. Even have the, the moon going around the Earth here. But we still have the Earth at the very center of our universe, at the center of our solar system. And so the sun with its orbiting planets uh, would be going around the Earth. But the fixed stars are all centered or are all arranged around the central Earth here. And so in this configuration, that would help explain the motions of the planets very well. Um, and it would also explain why there was no parallax uh, measurement. So he wasn't too terribly far off. Now, if you recall from last time, the first measured parallax of a star was um, a double star system just off the tail of Cygnus the Swan, a nice summertime constellation. Um, that star system was known as 61 Cygni. And you can actually see the two stars very easily in, in a small telescope. Um, but this star system not only has uh, close proximity to us so we can measure a parallax, it also has a pretty high proper motion, or in other words, a movement across the sky. So every year, if you take an image of it, um, as we see in these animations, you'll see the star system moving across the sky just a little bit. But over the course of a year, you'll see these stars moving back and forth some because of the motion of the Earth. And so again, this was the first system that had a parallax that was directly measured. Uh, and that was done about the 1830s. And then finally, if you recall from last week, uh, we spoke just a little bit about the Hipparchos satellite. Um, so Hipparchos, um, this is kind of an homage to um, the, uh, uh, the Greek astronomer Hipparchus, who's known for creating a very nice catalog of brightnesses of the, uh, the visible stars. Um, Hipparchos was a mission that was launched in 1989, and it operated for about four years. Here you can see a, an artist's depiction there. Hipparchos was the High Precision Parallax Collecting Satellite. Okay, so astronomers love acronyms. Um, but this produced the first massive catalog of high precision stellar positions and proper motions uh, for about 118,000 stars. And that catalog was released in 1997. There were other instruments on board uh, Hipparchos which were used for attitude control of the telescope and make sure the telescope was not uh, veering off course or wasn't starting to kind of shift in its position in space. Um, so data were, be, were being collected by um, 
um, other photometers um, in the satellite. And so when you, when you um, amass that data as well, which can be used to get parallaxes of stars, but just not as high precision, um, you get the Tycho 1 and the Tycho 2 catalogs, or the Tycho 1 and the Tycho 2 catalogs. So that brought the, the total parallax, or the number of stars that we have a parallax for, from 118,000 up to about 2.5 million. So the 118,000 have the very high precision measurements. Okay, and so um, the Hipparchus, uh, Hipparchus satellite um, could get down to a precision of about one milli arc second, or one one thousandth of an arc second. If you think back to Tycho, he's making measurements as good as one arc minute in the sky, and there's 60 arc seconds in every arc minute, and there are 1,000 milli arc seconds in every arc second. So this was getting to a much, much higher precision than Tycho could have ever imagined. And sure enough, we do detect the parallaxes of all of these different stars. And these stars, um, so Hipparchus was cataloging stars down to about a magnitude 11, which is about 100 times fainter than what the human eye can see, just naked eye. Okay. So now we move on to the, the star of uh, uh, this talk, which is the Gaia mission. So again, Gaia is a, a, actually a nice acronym. Um, it stands for Global Astrometric Interferometer for Astrophysics. Okay, it's quite a mouthful, so you can see why acronyms are such a popular thing in astronomy. Um, but if you look at the name, so um, astrometric, that's, that just means we're measuring the positions of objects very, very precisely. Um, interferometer, so interferometry is a technique used in astronomy to increase the resolution of your observations. So, you can, get a, you can get finer and finer detail in your observations if you have a much larger telescope, as in the main lens or the main mirror is much, much larger. Or, instead of using one humongous telescope, which is going to be very costly to build, you could build several small telescopes, separate them out, and combine the signals from those two telescopes to increase your resolution. And that is known as interferometry. Has anybody seen the movie Contact? All right, so here's Jodie Foster um, out at the VLA, the Very Large Array out in New Mexico. Here's a nice aerial view of it. But this is a classic example of um, an interferometer. So each one of these radio dishes um, is able to, to receive a signal very well. Okay, so it can, each dish can actually look at the sky. Um, but the problem with radio light is it's very long wavelength. So you have to have a very large receiver to get any sort of resolution. And even something the size of uh, these uh, radio dishes here is still not going to give you a very good resolution. But you notice we've got quite a few of these uh, radio telescopes here. And you notice how they're kind of configured, or configured, configured on, um, in kind of a Y pattern here. So this Y pattern um, there are tr essentially train tracks that run um, underneath of those telescopes. And each of these telescopes can be moved individually. So if you want to increase your resolution, you basically spread out your telescopes so that you have a, a, a much greater separation. And then you have to combine the signals of those telescopes, which is not an easy task, but yet it's done. Um, and you get a much, much higher resolution. So instead of having just several small telescopes here, the end result is you can achieve the resolution of a single telescope that is as large as this Y configuration here. Can't gather as much light, but you get the resolution that you need. Okay? So anyway, that's a, a nice example of, of interferometry. So originally, the Gaia mission was going to use two telescopes in space to uh, to gather the data, but later designs are now just using, or now just use one mission, okay, one object up in space. It actually has two telescopes in there, but they're not combining the light uh, to, to do an interferometer. Um, this is a European Space Agency mission. Uh, total cost is about one billion. Um, launched back in December of 2013, and it's projected to last five years, which um, as we keep finding out, a lot of these missions are created so well that they'll last well beyond their expected lifetime. 
Uh, for instance, the Hubble telescope uh, was projected to have a lifetime of about 10 years, and it's now on year 27. So it's still working beautifully. All right, so before we talk about um, how Gaia was launched, I want to give just a little bit more background here. Uh, um, something known as uh, a Lagrange point. So in this diagram, we have uh, the sun here, we have the earth here, we even have our little moon, which is not really relevant uh, for this uh, talk. But you notice that there are these five points that are labeled, L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. These are known as the Lagrange points. And these are areas where you have gravitational equilibrium. Or in other words, you have um, two gravitational forces working against each other or working with each other so that you have a spot where you could potentially put a satellite or some other object and it would stay in that spot. Okay? So the, the easiest to understand, um, at least for me anyway, is the L1 point. It's in between the Earth and the Sun. And at a distance of about one and a half million kilometers from the Earth, if you put, a, let's say, a satellite there, uh, the gravitational pull of the Earth cancels out just a little bit of the gravitational pull of the Sun. End result is an object placed at L1 will take exactly one year to orbit the Sun. Normally, if an object is closer to the Sun than the Earth, it won't take as much time. That's one of Kepler's uh, laws of planetary motion. Okay, so Venus, for instance, it, it's in a smaller orbit, so it doesn't take as long to go around the sun, but it's physically moving faster in its orbit. So at L1, um, a, a satellite would basically stay with the Earth. L2, which is about a million and a half kilometers um, past the Earth, if you stick a satellite there, um, the combined gravitational effects of the sun and the Earth will have that satellite orbiting with the Earth. So an object out at L2 will take one year to orbit. Um, L3 is just on the opposite side of the Sun from the Earth. Those first three points are actually unstable points. So if you put something in there at one of those points, it doesn't take much uh, gravitational pull to knock them out of those points. So they're just known as unstable points. But L4 and L5, those are actually gravitationally stable points. So you can put a satellite in there or uh, an asteroid can get caught in one of those regions and it'll just move around with the Earth um, and it can be nudged a little bit from its orbit and the gravitational um, forces will actually pull it back in to uh, that area. So if you knock it too hard, it will, uh, an object will go flying out of that area, but they're much more gravitationally stable than these three. But the reason I bring this up is the Gaia mission and the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope mission um, are at or are going to be at the L2 point. So that's going to be well beyond the moon. Okay. So here is Gaia shortly after its launch. So the, um, the, the rocket that launched it has now separated. Uh, the fairing has come off to uh, reveal the satellite. So let's go through this little animation. So it has a very nice sun shield, which unfurls. Um, if I recall correctly, this is about 30 feet across. And you'll notice on the bottom of that sun shield, there it is. Um, these little guys down here, these are solar panels, which are used to power uh, the satellite. But the main, other main purpose of this sun shield is to keep all of the instruments extremely cold. Okay, we've got, to, we've got to keep them very cold and we've got to keep them at the same temperature so that you don't get any expansion and contraction. So this satellite will stay at about minus 115 degrees Celsius. Okay. And so now we see Gaia moving on out towards the, uh, the L2 point. And then we'll change our viewing position. All right. So over on the right side of the screen, this is where our sun would be, somewhere way off over here. Here's our Earth. Here's Gaia's path. It's come on out. And the L2 point is right around in here. And it's kind of hard to see, but you can faintly see the shadow of the Earth here. Okay, since the sun is over there, the shadow of the Earth is going to be going this way. So let's continue on here. Now we're going to change our viewing perspective. Just keep watching how that satellite orbits. 
So that shape of, or that type of orbit is known as a, a Lissajous orbit. But notice how the satellite is always avoiding the shadow of the Earth. So if the satellite does pass, did pass into the shadow of the Earth, um, the, the, the sun would be completely blocked out. Um, you would have a several hundred degree temperature drop, which is not good for the telescope. It's going to mess up your, your observations. Um, but at this distance, you know, the moon's going to be up here somewhere. Um, the moon will occasionally pass in front of the sun, but at that distance, the moon is going to be too small to cover up the sun. So you will get a little bit of a temperature drop, but nothing nearly as severe as if um, the satellite passed into the shadow of the Earth. And so it just keeps on orbiting around that point. It does have some little thrusters on it, which can make small attitude corrections. And now what you're seeing, you'll first notice how the satellite is rotating. These yellow bars coming out of here, these are just showing um, the points of view of the telescope. So you can imagine these are the lines of sight of the two telescope systems. So there's one telescope system that's looking out the window here, so it's looking up here, and the other telescope system is looking out this way. And as the satellite is rotating on its spin axis, um, the, the telescopes are constant, constantly seeing the stars moving. Okay? And so over the course of one revolution, uh, you'll see um, the, the telescopes will be able to see a swath of the sky completely around them, okay? So there's a lot more to it than that. It's never that simple. So a little bit more about Gaia's orbit. So the sun shield is always going to be pointed towards the sun. It's got to be able to uh, point those solar panels to get energy from the sun. And we've also got to keep the telescope, it's, or the, the mission itself, very, very cold. Okay, so, and also you don't want stray sunlight coming in, um, uh, which will mess up your observations. And so the sun shield is also acting like a, um, a, a big uh, sun shield. Okay, so it's just going to block out the sun. Um, the spin axis, uh, which you just saw how the telescope was, was rotating, um, that rotational axis is angled 45 degrees to the sun Gaia axis. Or in other words, um, if we have, uh, let's say my projector here is our sun, and my hand is the, is the Gaia mission. We saw how the Gaia mission was just rotating along its spin axis. But imagine that spin axis is, is pointing towards our sun and spinning around that. That axis is angled about 45 degrees. And so as the satellite is spinning, that axis is also wobbling around like a top. Okay. So it, it's not just constantly rotating like that, it's rotating, but the whole satellite is wobbling like a, kind of like a big top. Okay, you can imagine how you can see the top spinning very rapidly, but over time you'll see it kind of sway around. So that's what we're, what we're talking about here. Now to make one of those, those wobbles um, takes about 63 days. The rotation of the satellite itself is about every six hours. Okay. And as, the, um, as you combine these rotations, um, the, those two motions, as the satellite is rotating, the telescopes are going to be sweeping out fields of view on the sky that we call great circles. Okay? But because of those two motions, every rotation is not going to show the telescopes the same field of view. They're going to overlap a little bit, but every rotation is going to bring in some new stars. And so you're gradually covering new portions of the sky. Get that slide there. So a little bit about the telescopes themselves. We're, we're eventually going to get to the science. So just, just hang tight. Um, so the, the two telescope systems are known as three mirror anastigmats. Okay. So this diagram here, this is a cross section of one type of an a three mirror anastigmat telescope. It's not the same configuration, but it's just to kind of show you how these work. So this cross section of this mirror here, you notice it, it looks kind of strange. This mirror has a big hole in the center, which is a common type of mirror found in many reflecting telescopes. Um, so the Hubble Space Telescope's main mirror has a hole in it. Um, our main telescope has a hole in it. Um, so if you were to see this mirror in front of you, it would look like a big donut. 
right? So light is going to be coming into the telescope system from the top of the screen. It's going to hit this first mirror. So that mirror is curved. You can have a very simple type of mirror known as a spherical mirror. All right? And so this diagram over here, this is a cross section. This blue area is a cross section of one of those spherical mirrors. So the curve of that mirror is basically the shape of part of a ball, if you will. So it's kind of like somebody took a piece of molten glass and just stuck a ball down into it and made a nice spherical indentation. So that's the, the most basic type of mirror. The problem, though, is that a spherical mirror cannot focus light into a single focal plane. So if you were to have a telescope with just a spherical mirror, your image would be relatively focused, but it would always have some blur to it. Okay? There is a way to counteract that. And that's by, instead of making a spherical curve, you instead make a parabolic curve. Okay? And so this mirror, uh, normally tel or a, a very simple spherical telescope, will suffer from something called spherical aberration, which is that blurring. But you can counteract that by giving this first mirror a parabolic shape. Parabolic mirrors, though, suffer from coma. So as you start looking towards the edge of the field of view, your stars are going to start getting elongated and they're going to start taking on kind of a cone shape to them. So that's coma, which is not good, especially if you're trying to nail down the precise positions of your targets. So you can correct that by having the light come in, reflect off that first parabolic mirror, and go up to another mirror, which has a specific type of curvature that corrects for that coma. And so then, as the light reflects off of that mirror, you'll often have astigmatism. You can correct for that by reflecting the light off of a third mirror, which has its own curvature. But once the light reflects off of that and is focused onto the focal plane where maybe your, your camera is located, the image is very flat. There's no defects. So um, this is going to be really important if you're trying to nail down the precise positions of over you know, a few hundred million stars. So this is the, the, the basic concept of the three mirror anastigmat. So here is a, a rotation of the, the chassis of the Gaia mission. So inside of that, that little cylinder that you saw on the, the back side of that sun shield, this is what's housed inside of that. And so this assembly is used to hold uh, the mirrors that make up uh, the telescope systems of uh, the Gaia mission. So I'm going to pause this and, and kind of go through what we're seeing. So these pieces labeled M1 and M1 prime, these are the primary mirrors of the two telescope systems. These are the mirrors that are looking out those windows and seeing the stars rotating past as the satellite is rotating. So those mirrors catch the incoming light. They are curved. They reflect the light down to the M2 mirror. This one reflects it down to the M2 prime mirror. Let me rotate just a bit here. So those mirrors, oops. So those mirrors are actually located down here. And once the light hits those mirrors, it is then reflected onto a third mirror. I'm going to tilt up just a little bit here. Okay. So light from the M1 mirror reflects down here where the M2 mirror is. M2 then reflects over to M3. That's our three mirror anastigmat. Okay. But our camera is located way down here. And we've got two telescopes looking at different parts of the sky. So we've got to get all of that light to our cameras. Down here are the M4 and the M4 prime mirrors that catch that incoming light. Those mirrors then reflected over to two flat mirrors labeled M5 and M6. And those mirrors reflect over to our cameras. So it, it's a pretty complicated system. So to give you an idea of how big these are, here are the primary mirrors, M1 and M1 prime. So these are about four and a half by one and a half feet um, on the side. Uh, they're made out of silicon carbide with a protected silver coating. That's, that uh, silicon carbide is really thermally stable. 
Um, you can have a big temperature swing, and it's really not going to expand and contract any appreciable amount, which is going to be really important so that we keep focus and also so that our images don't shift in between observations. Here are the other mirrors. So this one is about a foot by about half a foot on a side. This one is about, uh, let's see here, two feet by about one and a half feet. And then the little mirrors that catch the, the light are pretty small. You can see somebody's hand right here. And then the M5 and M6 mirrors, known as the folding mirrors, their job is just to kind of redirect the light to the camera. So they're, they're flat, um, so nothing particularly, uh, in my opinion, super interesting about those. But, um, but the camera system, here's the camera system. Um, so each of these little blue rectangles is a CCD detector that has about nine megapixels. All right, so your, your cameras, like in your phones, they have a, a little bitty version of these guys. Um, but there are 106 CCDs on here. So you add up all the megapixels, that's almost one billion pixels. All right, so uh, it's about 938 megapixels, so they usually call it the billion pixel camera, or the gigapixel. Um, but you'll notice that they are, are um, arranged in sections. We've got two columns that are separated here, a group of 12 here, two uh, columns here, and then about seven, no, excuse me, nine columns here. So those detectors are separated into groups because they belong to different uh, instruments on the Gaia mission. Let's talk just a little bit about how these work, just a, a simplified model. So you can imagine that, so if you were to zoom in on one of those detectors, you can imagine a grid with nine million squares on them. Okay, and every one of those little squares is gonna be what we call a pixel. They're light sensitive. As light comes in and strikes one of those pixels, a little bit of charge is knocked loose. The more light that comes in to hit the pixels, the more charge that builds up uh, for that pixel. And ultimately at the end, a computer, at the end of the exposure, a computer will then read out how much charge is on each of those pixels and convert that, in, that information into an image that we can see. I'm gonna switch out of this for just a second. Let's bring up a little simulation. So these 20 little buckets up here, uh, which are gonna hold water in this simulation, um, you can think of these as individual pixels in your CCD. Okay, so imagine nine million of these. Um, that's gonna be one of those CCD detectors. So what we're going to do is restart this. We're gonna start an exposure, or in other words, we're gonna see raindrops come falling in here and fill up the buckets. All right, so there's our exposure. Now you can see, well, uh, those in the front row can see it better. Um, these little buckets have differing levels of water, okay? And you'll also notice there's a pipe connecting all of the buckets in a row. So all five of these are connected together, all five of these are connected. And then there's a pipe connecting all of these rows um, um, so that uh, everything empties out through here. So now that our exposure is done, how does the computer read it out? So it transfers the charge, or in this case the rain, from one pixel down to a little counter. That counter is then um, goes to a microprocessor which determines how much rain was in the bucket or in this case, or in the case of a, a real CCD, how much charge was on the pixel. But you'll notice that as, one, as this one is read out, the charge, or in this case the water, is then transferred down the line uh, from pixel to pixel and then is eventually read out by this little device here. Once we have a, a column finished, all of the charge from the previous column is then transferred over and we begin the process again. Okay. So, you know, think about this in your phone that takes an image in less than a 30th of a second and it's reading, you know, over a million pixels. This process is incredibly fast. Okay. But um, it, it's good to understand how this works because this is going to be important in understanding how the detectors are able to read out their data. I'm going to pause this, go back. All right, 
So now here's Gaia again. Sun shield's here, so the sun is down here somewhere. This is where all of the, t the telescopes are, are located. And what you're going to see here is a blue beam, which is representing the line of sight or the field of view of Gaia on the sky, uh, one of the telescopes. And then this purple beam is going to represent the field of view of that second telescope. All right, so as the satellite is rotating, the field of view is constantly changing. And so um, the fields of view here are sweeping out big circles on the sky. And again, because of the motion of the satellite, the, the fields of view are constantly changing as the satellite completes um, an orbit. So here you can kind of see the, the, the stars that would be visible in each field of view. And again, this rotation takes about six hours. Now we're going to move in and see what's going on in here. And so now you can kind of see how the light reflects off all of those mirrors. Comes down here and then reflects over to the camera. So here are all of our pixels. And here are how the star images are formed on these pixels. So this is for the first telescope. And now we have the second telescope, which is offset at about 106 degrees. So the light comes in, hits one, two, three, four, five, six, comes on over. And now the light from the second telescope is also simultaneously landing on the detectors. Okay. Now as the satellite is rotating, those stars are going to sweep across our, our detectors here. So you can imagine that if you were taking a long exposure image, let me pause this right quick. You can imagine that if you were taking a long exposure image, the stars would just appear as streaks in the image. Okay? But Gaia's uh, CCDs take an image about every 982 microseconds, or just under a thousandth of a second. So now as the stars are moving across, that roughly one thousandth of a second is how long it takes a star to go from one pixel to the next based on how fast the spacecraft is rotating. Okay? So as it's taking these individual snapshots, it's going to build up an image. Now the other problem is, since we've got a billion pixels to work with, that's going to be a lot of data, and we can't download all of that data. Let me back this up just a little bit here. So the, the stars are going to, to come across these two columns of CCDs first. These are known as the star mapper CCDs. So the computer takes an image, or, uh, or the, the, uh, the detectors take an image. The computer looks at those images and says, OK, this column of, of CCDs, this is uh, uh, going to pertain to stars that come from telescope one. This column is going to pertain to stars that come from telescope two. And so as a star, like in here, as a, uh, in this pixel, or in this uh, CCD here, as a star lands on this sky mapper CCD, the computer makes note of where it's located. And it says, OK, I know the star is located right here. It's going to be moving across the field of view this way. So as this star comes across these CCDs, I don't need to worry about all of the, the data that's up in this part of the CCD, because that's not going to have my target stars. I'm only going to pay attention to the pixels that are down here that the star is actually going to go across. Okay? So that'll make the, the data download much quicker, and we don't have to worry about all the, the superfluous data. And so the computer will then basically just look at a window of pixels around a star as it's going across the CCD. Okay? And as it's going across all those pixels, remember it's taking an exposure about every one thousandth of a second. And by the time the star has crossed completely across a CCD, it then takes all of those individual pictures, adds them up to get the final image. Okay? So you can see here in this little simulation how the star's image is getting a little bit brighter as it's going across the CCD as all of those uh, individual images are being added up. So 
here's the focal plane. This is kind of a, a busy image here. But the thing I want to take away from this is that there are several different instruments um, at the, the, the focal plane. So you've got your sky mapper CCDs here, which are used to select the targets and track them um, for when they come across the, the science instruments. Um, these, this big swath of, of detectors right in here, those are the ones that are going to be used to, to make the measurements of the position very, very accurately. Okay? So once the stars pass across those, the starlight then enters two prisms. Uh, one prism looks at the, the blue portion of the spectrum. One prism looks at the red portion of the spectrum. And so we can get a lot of information just by breaking apart the light and looking at different portions of the spectrum. So for instance, we can get the temperature of the stars by looking at how bright they are in each of these different parts of the spectrum. And then finally, as the starlight moves across those, it then passes through this device here, which is a radial velocity spectrograph. This is going to tell us how fast the stars are moving towards or away from us. And that's going to be important for figuring out how fast they're actually moving in 3D space. Again, here's just a, a little diagram showing all of those uh, CCDs. Uh, there are four other uh, detectors that are not used for the science. Uh, these two purple ones, those are known as wavefront sensors, and those basically monitor the focus of the telescopes. So if the star begins to get out of focus, the computer will then uh, be able to detect that from those images, from those two detectors, and move the mirrors ever so slightly. Uh, these two over here are known as the basic angle monitor uh, sensors. So we've got six different mirrors. They've got to stay in perfect alignment. If you have any temperature variations, that can cause expansion and contraction that will throw those mirrors out of alignment by just a tiny amount. So th these guys are used with a, a system of lasers, and um, the lasers create a, a pattern on the detectors. And if any one of the mirrors moves just ever so slightly, that pattern will change. And the computer will be able to detect that and realign the mirrors. Okay. So just to kind of show you um, these instruments, here are the two prisms uh, that are used uh, to get the, the, the spectra, the, the blue side and the red side. Here's the, the radial velocity spectrograph. So at the heart of it is something known as a diffraction grating, which basically has thousands of little grooves carved into it about every millimeter. So as light passes through that, it tends to, to scatter and interfere with itself. And the ultimate uh, result is you get a rainbow out of it, or a spectrum out of it. Okay. So uh, when you look at the spectrum of a star, you'll see little features that you can then uh, use to learn about that star. Um, that grading goes right in the middle of there, and there are four lenses, uh, two on either side, uh, that correct the field for that radial velocity spectrograph. So the light of the stars passes through that device first and then lands on those 12 CCDs to get a spectrum. So the acquisition, being up in space, a million and a half kilometers from us, the download speed is about five megabits per second. Okay? Um, the European Space Agency has the Deep Space Array. Uh, this is one of, I think, three antennas located around the globe, uh, but they maintain the, the download link. Um, with the, with the uh, Gaia mission, uh, about 35 meter diameter here, okay, so roughly 100 feet wide. Um, if you remember those stars as they go across the detectors, we only look at a little window of pixels around the stars, so um, only that data are selected and, um, and transmitted back to the ground. Every day, 50 gigabytes of data are downloaded. And by the end of the five-year mission, we'll have about a petabyte of data. So a 1,000 terabytes, a million gigabytes, however you want to say it. So it's a tremendous amount of data. All right. So here are some of the missions. Uh, for the astrometry portion, um, Gaia is going to try to get th uh, very detailed 3D distributions of the position and the motion of stars down to 20th magnitude. Okay, so remember, Hipparchos went down to 
about 11th magnitude. So this is going to be almost 10,000 times fainter than what Hipparchus is going to be able, uh, was able to detect. Um, 10 million stars, which are, are closer and brighter, um, they will have just an uncertainty in their positions and, and movements by only about 1%. Uh, but the other 100 million will have an uncertainty of no greater than 10%. So, uh, pretty good. So here's the first map of the sky. And you may notice some uh, kind of like a uh, little banding on here. Um, that's just an artifact of the fact that the telescope is rotating and it's seeing bands on the sky. And so as it continues to go back over the sky, um, getting at least 70 observations of all of its target stars, then you'll notice that banding kind of goes away. But the glow here is not just kind of haze. This is positional data for one, just a little over one billion stars. Okay? And this was known as the housekeeping data. This is the data just from those sky mapper CCDs. That's not all the, the really good data from those other C, uh, um, roughly, what, 90 CCDs. Uh, but you'll notice that there are uh, got the nice band of the Milky Way, the dark areas, or where we have a lot of dust blocking out the background stars. There are, here are even the two large and small Magellanic clouds which orbit our galaxy. There are little satellite galaxies. Um, and there are even star clusters uh, notated on here. Now you won't see things like uh, the, the belt of Orion on, on this map. Those stars are gonna be much too bright for the, the first pass of uh, the Gaia mission. Okay, so later on, they're going to try to work to um, get really good data on the brighter stars, but you're not going to see the roughly 9,000 bright stars that you can see in the night sky on here. Um, they're just going to be a little bit too bright for the, um, uh, the CCDs to work with at this moment. So the radial velocity, uh, we mentioned before that um, you've got a proper motion on the sky, so stars can be moving left, right, up, down on the sky. You can see that with the astrometry, but it's hard to tell how they're moving towards or away from you. I mean, if they're moving exactly towards you, you're not going to see them moving at all, okay, even though they may be moving at a very high rate of speed. So Gaia can very easily get the proper motion, and if you know the distance to those stars, then you can figure out how fast they're moving left, right, up, and down. But getting that radial velocity is necessary to figure out just how fast the star is actually moving and which direction through space is actually moving. So this is where we use the radial velocity spectrograph. So here's the sun spectrum. So you basically take a rainbow and you stretch that rainbow out. You cut it and stack those little se cut sections on top of one another. Um, you'll notice that there are a lot of these little black bands, like right up there, there's two dominant ones here, three here. Those are known as absorption lines, and they are due to elements in the atmosphere of the sun absorbing out certain colors. The nice thing about it, every element absorbs its own set of colors. It doesn't share a single, no element will share a single color with another element. So when we look in a star spectrum and we see this, this specific shade of red missing, we know that's hydrogen absorbing out that, that color of red. So we know hydrogen's in the star. These two yellow lines, for example, are sodium. These three dark bands are magnesium. Um, and there are basically about 75, 80 elements that are doing all of this absorption. Okay? And again, every line only belongs to one element. So every element has multiple lines, but um, the colors that are missing are kind of like a fingerprint for all of the elements. Now, if we look at those lines for an object uh, that is sitting still with respect to us, we will see those dark bands fall in specific parts of the spectrum. But if the object happens to be moving away from us, then the light gets stretched a little bit, and we will see those bands shift over to the red side of the spectrum. And so you'll notice that all of these dark bands are now just a little bit more towards the right side of the screen. If the object is coming towards us, then we get the opposite effect. Uh, they move towards the blue side. And the faster the object is moving towards or away from you, the greater the shift you're going to see. And so this is known as Doppler shift or, or red shifting. So um, the radial velocity spectrograph is able to see these, these dark bands in the spectrum of a star. And from that, you can deduce the radial velocities. 
And since you can see how they're moving on the sky, you can get their proper motion velocities and figure out how they're actually moving through 3D space. So just some of the, uh, the, pro or the uh, goals for um, getting properties of stars, you can get things like surface temperatures, luminosities, chemical abundances, or in other words, how much of every element is present in a star, and also things like interstellar extinction. So to give you an example of the latter, so this is a graph of just color versus intensity. And so um, every one of these little dips that you see in each of these graphs is basically going to correspond to one of those dark bands that we saw in the spectrum of the star, like our sun. Okay? And there, there's one feature here that's noted with the little red arrow. Um, it's also labeled DIB. It stands for diffuse interstellar band. That's basically a line created by material in between us and the star, namely dust. Okay? So we're looking in the infrared part of the spectrum here, but we can see the effect that dust has on the spectrum of the star. And you have to account for how much dust is in between you and the star to recalibrate your spectrum to get the true properties of the star. Dust tends to make stars look much redder than they actually are. So once you calibrate for how much stuff is in between you and the stars, then you can get, for instance, the true luminosities of the stars. Um, so, let's see, we are running out of time here, so let me just skip to a couple of other things. Oh, actually, I'm almost done anyway. So, uh, let's see, I think there's just one more, gra no, two graphs. Um, so this is a graph of color versus intensity at each of those colors. So this is the visible portion of the, uh, the spectrum that your eyes can detect. To the left of that would be infrared, or excuse me, to the left of that would be ultraviolet light. To the right of that would be infrared. Okay. So what we're seeing here are three different graphs of stars of different temperatures. We're looking at how bright they are in each of the colors of uh, going from infrared through ultraviolet. So this cooler star, about 3,000 Kelvin, which would be a nice red star, you can see that it kind of peaks right out here and starts to die off. So it's going to produce most of its light in the infrared part of the spectrum. Okay? And it's going to produce more red light than blue light. So it's going to appear redder. A star like our sun actually emits more in all colors than a 3,000 Kelvin star. But notice its peak is over in the visible part of the spectrum. So our sun which is about 6,000 Kelvin, emits most of its light in visible light, the kind of light that our eyes can see. In fact, it emits most of its visible light in the green part of the spectrum. Okay, so, and it's not really a coincidence that our eyes are most sensitive to green. So um, now you go to a 12,000 Kelvin star, which is going to appear very bluish white. It produces much more light in every color than our sun. In fact, most of its light is produced out in the ultraviolet. This, is going to, this, um, um, this concept is going to be very useful for determining temperatures. So here is a 4,000 Kelvin star, a 6,000 Kelvin star, and an 8,000 Kelvin star. And we're just looking at the visible portion of the spectrum, what our eyes could see. And what you can do is uh, look through uh, different types of filters at a star and see how bright that star is at certain colors. So if we were to look at an 8,000 Kelvin star through a blue filter and a green filter, you would see it would appear brighter in the blue filter than in the green filter. Okay? And you can see by this graph, um, it produces this much light in the green and more in the blue up here. So a blue star is going to have more blue light than green light. A star like our sun, though, you can see that it produces this much green light in pretty much the same amount of blue light. <coughs> a cooler star is going to produce a little bit of green light, but even less blue light. So if I see a situation where I have a star producing about the same amount of blue light and green light, I can say it's going to be about 6,000 Kelvin. Okay? If it produces a lot more blue light than green light, I know it's going to be a much hotter star, so it's going to be about maybe 8,000 Kelvin. And if it produces just a tiny bit of each of those light, types of light, 
but ends up producing much less blue light, I know it's going to be a much cooler star. And so this is kind of the concept that you can get by using those two prisms um, that the starlight is passing through. So you can get a, a, a temperature determination um, just by looking at the intensities of stars in different colors. Uh, galactic properties. So Gaia is also going to try to um, help us get a better understanding of structure and motions of stars within our Milky Way. And this is a really nice animation based on the first data release. Which, and so this kind of looks like an artist's drawing here, but these are individual points of light that have been generated, and they each represent a star. Okay, and there are about a little over two million stars in this image. But in the first year of, of its operation, Gaia has been able to, to get the proper motions of the stars, um, figure out how fast the stars are moving across the sky, and also get those radial velocities. So it's been able to nail down the positions and velocities of about two million stars. And the folks at the, uh, the, the Deepak Center put together this really nice animation. So they're putting together a visualization to show you how these two million stars are actually moving in our galaxy. Okay. So it's really kind of neat to watch. Um, it starts out, you can see Orion over here, but those stars are also moving. But um, it's just really neat to see how everything is kind of moving around the center of the galaxy. You notice that stars towards the top and bottom tend to zip by. Uh, that's just a distortion because, remember, we're looking all over the sky. So it's kind of like taking a map of the globe and doing the Mercator projection, you know, how Antarctica always looks bigger than Asia. Same thing happens here. So when a star gets up close to the top, it tends to zip by. But anyway, this is not just a, a nice little artist rendering. This is based on actual data. Gaia is really good at spotting variable stars. If you remember the Cepheid variables we talked about last week, they change in their brightness. So you can see, uh, like this star here, uh, was at its peak brightness, it started to fade out, and then it puffed back up, and it's starting to fade out again, and it just repeatedly does this. Okay. Uh, this, maybe two other things here. So some of the non-stellar uh, objects, uh, things like exoplanets, brown dwarfs, which are basically these objects that aren't big enough to become stars, um, supernovae, uh, those are, and exoplanets, those are all things that are also going to be studied by Gaia. So just to give you an idea um, for exoplanets, so if you watch a star over the course of, you know, uh, any given length of time, if we happen to be viewing that star and, let's say, its planet system from above, as that planet orbits, it's tugging a little bit on its star. So the, the star is not essentially just sitting there. The planet is doing most of the orbiting, but the star is also moving around as well. Okay? Jupiter does that to our sun. Um, it's the big guy in the solar system, so it tugs on the sun the most. So if you watch a star, um, it'll wobble around in the sky. And that's due to a planet pulling on it as the planet orbits. And with Gaia's very high precision uh, uh, astrometry, it'll be able to see this wobble and be able to detect exoplanets that way, or these planets that are orbiting their stars. And um, occasionally stars will pass in front, or excuse me, planets will pass in front of their stars and dim the light. Gaia will be able to detect that as well. And if it happens over and over, then it may be a planet. Uh, supernovae. So here is a, a galaxy, faraway galaxy, that has a star exploding in it. Here's the galaxy beforehand, and so when you subtract that image from that, you're left with the supernova image. And we can even get spectra of a supernova to see how it evolves over time. And I think the last thing I'll, I'll point out here is um, we'll also discover many things in our solar system as well. So what you're seeing here is an all-sky map. Um, this is lined up with the Earth's equator. This band is known as the ecliptic. This is where you would see the planets passing through our sky, where you'd see the sun going through. This is where a lot of asteroids also orbit in our sky. Okay, it's basically the plane of the solar system. What you're seeing here are about 50,000 objects. So that's how many asteroids we know 
orbit our sun. Okay, and most of these are within the um, area between Mars and Jupiter, known as the asteroid belt. And the color here, so as Gaia is scanning the sky, it's able to find these asteroids because they're constantly on the move. They move appreciably between every exposure. And so if the object is in one exposure but not in the other exposure, you basically know it's an asteroid or some sort of comet. Um, so the, the, all of these data points are showing the positions of asteroids on the sky at, at a certain time. Okay? And you can see how they're distributed nicely around the sky. The color here tells you, so Gaia is able to see these asteroids. And uh, when, you, um, when you calculate the position of those asteroids from the Gaia data and compare them to where they should be based on their known orbits, the color is going to tell you how closely those two parameters match, how, uh, where Gaia found them and where they should be. And so you'll see that in, most of these asteroids are in blue, which means that um, they only deviated maybe 0.2 arc seconds from their, uh, their predicted positions. There is an area right in here in the red. This is where uh, you have uh, the central portion of the Milky Way passing through the sky. And so because there are so many stars in that field of view, it makes it much harder to actually uh, pick out these asteroids very accurately. Okay? But still, um, you're within maybe an arc second or so. So in short, Gaia is, you know, is producing a tremendous amount of data. One thing I didn't mention, it can get a precision of about one milli arc second, or excuse me, one micro arc second. So a thousand times better than Hipparchos. Or in other words, it can measure um, a position accurately enough that um, it, it'd be able to see the, uh, the width of a human hair at a distance of a thousand kilometers. Okay, so. Very, very incredibly precise, which is what you need in order to see these very tiny parallax shifts. Um, and ultimately, it will nail down the positions and velocities of over one billion stars. And I think we're out of time here. So questions, I would be happy to answer. Yes. Thank you. So the, the question was, you know, when you look at these Lagrange points, um, this, the L1 point, that's basically where the uh, gravity of the Earth cancels a little bit of the gravity of the Sun, and so L1, um, uh, this point basically moves with the Earth. Uh, same for L2, but why not L4 and L5? Um, because, you know, these guys, these points aren't directly in between the Earth and the Sun. Um, so how is it that those are stable points? Um, it, it's not an easy thing to explain, I'll, I'll put it that way. A lot of it comes out of the, the math derivation, but um, I, I, I think that's basically how I'm just going to have to leave it at that. Okay. I'm sorry I can't give you a more satisfying answer. Um, but yeah, the, um, the thing that also keep in mind is that these are the stable points. In fact, um, Jupiter, when it's orbiting the sun, if you look 60 degrees ahead of it and 60 degrees behind of it, um, in its orbit, there are asteroids that are stuck there. They're known as Trojan asteroids. So even though Jupiter has a very nice gravitational pull, um, that gravitational pull working with the sun is not able to pull those asteroids out of that, that location. Yeah? Is Gaia data going to be used to go back to the Big Bang? I don't think so, but I... I just have to say, I don't know, but I would not think so. Very back there. You talked about the Doppler effect in space. We also hear about the Doppler effect on weather. Yes. How are they similar or different? So the Doppler effect, uh, we, we talked about that, where we see the light um, uh, stretching and compressing, uh, which causes these, uh, these absorption features to move based on the velocity of the object. How is that related to like Doppler radar? It's basically the, the same principle. So when you have, um, and it's also the principle that's used in radar guns that you know, cops use in speed traps, okay? <laughs> so like in a, um, in the, the, uh, in a weather station, so the, the uh, 
uh, radar station will send out a, um, uh, a radar signal of a certain frequency. And so when that radar hits rain, for instance, some of it gets reflected back. That rain is not just sitting still. I mean, the, the clouds are going to be uh, you know, moving towards or away from us. So the rain's moving towards or away from us a little bit. And so when the radar signal returns to um, uh, the, the radar station, it's going to have changed a frequency just a little bit. And so by looking at the chain, or how much of a frequency change there was, you can determine how fast the rain was actually moving. So you can also um, use that uh, to, to determine how fast the winds are moving in a storm as well. And like when a, with, uh, with a, a police radar gun, um, the gun shoots out a, um, usually it's a microwave signal of a certain frequency, and when it reflects off of your oncoming vehicle, based on how fast your vehicle is moving, that reflected frequency is shifted just a, a little bit. Okay, it's not much, but uh, the more, or the faster you're speeding, then the more of a, a shift you get. And so the, the gun then just looks at the return frequency, subtracts it from the, the original frequency, divides it through, and gets a speed out of that. Yes? Yes. Yes. Right. So, um, for um, so going back to one of the the first slides, so the <coughs> European Space Agency's Gaia mission costs a total of about a billion. Uh, was it this one? No. There it is. Um, so this data, so for a, a, a mission like this, and even for things like the Hubble Space Telescope, I mean, through its development, some of the cameras are well over a billion dollars. Um, the data is typically proprietary for about one year. So for Hubble, it's proprietary for one year. So if an astronomer gets um, time on the Hubble, they get their data, they have one year to do all their research before it's turned loose to the public. And, and anybody with a computer can then access it for free. Uh, for Gaia, I'm not sure uh, if there's a proprietary period or not. Um, it'll have to go through a calibration phase to get the, the data science ready. But um, the first data release has already been published, and so now the, the general public can go in and mine the data if they want to. Yeah. So you don't have to be an astronomer to do it. Anybody that can with the computer. How fast are the stars moving away or towards us? Um, on the order of maybe a few tens of kilometers per second. So um, there are other stars that, uh, for instance, that are known as high velocity halo stars, uh, which can be moving uh, several hundred kilometers per second relative to us. But the thing about our, our spiral galaxy is that since we live in the disk of the galaxy, the stars for the most part, I mean, they've got kind of random motions, but for the most part, they're all moving around the center of the galaxy. So we're all orbiting together. Stuff that's closer into the center is going to be moving a little bit faster than stuff um, that's farther out from us. But uh, usually on the order of maybe a few tens of kilometers per second at, at most. Um, some of them can be moving maybe a kilometer per second relative to us. Yeah. Will it help with the study of dark energy and dark matter? I honestly don't know. Um, there, one thing I, did I leave it at the end? Um, it may, let me see. Yes, so uh, one thing I didn't uh, point out is, so, you know, the, uh, the spacecraft is not gonna, its telescopes aren't gonna be angled anywhere near the sun, okay? Um, but when you have a bright planet like Jupiter, um, that's, that's not going to damage the telescope. So um, as Gaia is scanning the sky, it'll occasionally come across things like Jupiter, uh, maybe Venus if it's far enough out in its orbit. But if you look around Jupiter, what you might see are, um, you might see some faint stars around it. And you may see their positions shifted just a little bit because of the warpage of space around them caused by Jupiter's gravity. And so that was one thing that was pointed out as well um, is that uh, may get a few tests of general relativity here. So um, that, that might tie into that. Um, it's kind of in the same field, but I just honestly don't know. Yes? Why use an unstable 
Um, so why does it use an unstable Lagrange point? So um, you, you don't want to get it to be too terribly far out, um, but um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to think of the other reason. I don't know, I have to get back to you on that one. Good. One more, yeah. So, so generally, is everything still moving away from us uh, in the universe, not necessarily like stars in the Milky Way? For the most part, everything in the universe is expanding out from us. Now, um, the Milky Way is part of what's known as the local group, which is about 30 galaxies. Uh, the Andromeda Galaxy and Milky Way are the two big guys in there. Um, so we're all kind of caught in each other's gravity, and the Andromeda Galaxy is actually moving towards us. Um, but on the whole, everything is expanding away from us due to the expansion of the universe. Is there a question over here? You mean like the stars? So the question was, what is the incidence of, of collision between objects in the Milky Way like the stars? Um, there's maybe one or two stars out of the 400 billion in our galaxy will collide um, you know, in any appreciable amount of time. So, like the, so one thing we do at the observatory is a little planet walk where we shrink down our solar system to make our sun an eight inch ball. And on that scale, the next nearest star to us, Proxima Centauri, would be about the size of a racquetball but on that scale would be about 3,000 miles from us. Okay, so you can imagine objects that size separated by those great distances. It's very rare for things to, to collide. And a, like a globular cluster where the density is much, much higher, you may get some stars colliding, which may explain why there are some very bright blue stars in these very old clusters. Because the, the blue stars should have died a long time ago, so it's thought that maybe two stars did merge to form a much heavier star.